My name is Crystal Riccio, and today I'll be presenting a review of hemostasis, including antiplatelet, anticoagulant, and fibrinolytic therapies. This is a review, so in preparation for this day, I expect that you would recall the anatomy of the vascular system, as well as, at least in part, the pathophysiology of hemostasis and the pharmaceutics of the antithrombotics presented from your P1 year. So this is a review in order to prepare for the therapeutics as taught through cardiology. This is a five part series. So this is part one of five different videos that you are expected to have watched prior to coming to class on day two of cardiology. The learning outcomes will maintain the same for all five videos. However, it is the expectation that you will have watched all five videos prior to attending class on day two. The materials that we will cover will are listed here in the learning outcomes. Of note, I will highlight areas to focus on throughout the lecture materials in the videos. On the day of class, we will summarize what was taught and then apply the material through active learning, quizzes, and the like. So please come to class prepared and I look forward to seeing you there. Hemostasis is a balancing act. On the left side of this balance, we see that there's thrombosis or coagulation, which would lead to the clotting of the blood. As well as on the right side of this balance, you'll notice that there's fibrinolysis and anticoagulation. Those are to break down the clot and allow for resolution of blood flow. As we injure the vessels, we do need to heal those vessels. Those injured vessels will form a clot as they're healing, and then we don't want those clots to remain there, so our body will also lyse that clot through fibrinolysis or thrombolysis in order to regain that blood flow that was there before. This is a fine-tuned balance. There are multiple regulatory processes in place in order to keep this in check so that we are not walking around as a giant clot and we're also able to maintain blood flow without excessively bleeding out. The process of hemostasis begins at the injury of the vessel. The first response of our body is to vasoconstrict the area. This vasoconstriction occurs really rapidly in order to reduce blood loss from that injured vessel, whether it be an intravascular injury or extravascular injury, we want to vasoconstrict the area to avoid blood loss and to bring the blood contents together in order to promote the next steps in the process. Step two would be platelet adhesion, activation, and aggregation, which occur very rapidly in order to form a loose but closed platelet plug that further reduces blood loss from the area. Third, we activate the clotting cascade as you recall, there are a number of different steps that contribute to an active clotting cascade, which at the base will form an, a solid fibrin clot that is developed within and among the platelets, which have now plugged and form a solid clot. Following the clot formation, our body is healing that vessel, and we don't want to leave that clot there. So we have fibrinolysis occur, which is the dissolution of the clot. It is important that we understand the detailed steps of steps two through four in order to adequately identify what drugs fall into which class and where they work within this process to either enhance clotting or bleeding, uh, whatever the need may be. Here we have a cross-sectional image of a blood vessel and you'll notice that in a healthy blood vessel, we have a number of substances that were responsible for understanding their role and responsibilities in maintaining that healthy blood vessel wall. However, in an injured blood vessel wall, we have a very opposite goal in mind, and that is to vasoconstrict. To begin with, we have a healthy vessel wall will promote vasodilation. So we have a number of substances listed here. We have released from our endothelial lining cells, nitric oxide, which we know is a potent vasodilator. We have prostacyclin, similarly a vasodilator, 
And we have this adenosine diphosphatase, which is an enzyme breaking down ADP. This enzyme is very responsible for avoiding overactivation of platelets when it's unnecessary. So remember this is a healthy blood vessel wall. We don't want to have platelet activation promoting the platelet plug, which we'll learn about in just a moment. In which case we break down unnecessary ADP that's available in the blood. When we do have an injured vessel wall, however, we have a very opposite goal in mind. That is to vasoconstrict the area. As we release from the subendothelial matrix a number of substances which promote not only vasoconstriction but also the formation of the plug and can be utilized in the clotting cascade, we're promoting the formation of a clot. So here we have endothelin, which is a vasoconstrictor, is released. We also have exposure of collagen, which will initiate platelet adhesion as well as the intrinsic cascade, which we'll learn about in the latter steps. We also have release of von Willebrand factor, which we'll learn about is useful for platelets as well as, uh, well, for platelets mainly. Then we have fibrinogen, which is utilized in the formation of the clot. This is the last step in the clotting cascade. And then we have tissue factor, which is released and can initiate the extrinsic pathway. Rather quickly after the injury of the vessel, we will get platelet plug formation. This begins with the process of adhesion. Remember on a resting platelet we do have some receptors available. In this case we have GP1A and GP1B which are abundantly available on the surface of a resting platelet. This platelet will come in contact with the injury site. GP1A will bind directly to collagen. GP1B will bind to von Willebrand factor then to collagen. In either of these two receptors, if they're bound to the collagen at the injury site, we call that adhesion. So we have GP1A binding directly to collagen, GP1B binding to von Willebrand factor, then to collagen, causing adhesion of that platelet to the injury site. Once we have adhesion, these platelets then go through the process of activation. These will activate themselves as well as recruit surrounding platelets in the area as they're going through their changes. So the activation begins with a conformational change. That conformational change will cause expression of GP2B3A receptors on the surface of the platelet. This is the most abundant surface receptor. However, in a resting platelet, they are wrapped in and amongst one another. And in an expression, they become expressed through the conformational change that occurs at activation. We also get degranulation of the vesicles. These vesicles, which are stored within the resting platelet, contain a number of substances that are released upon that conformational change through activation. These vesicles contain ADP, which we know is a platelet activator. We also get release of thromboxane A2, which we'll uh, see is also released at the same time as the vesicles, uh, not just from the vesicles, but also from the platelet itself, which is a potent activator of neighboring platelets. We also get release of von Willebrand factor, which can promote adhesion, further adhesion, and aggregation, as well as other substances that could be used in the clotting cascade later on. So as we go through activation, we get a conformational change expressing that GP2B3A receptor all over the surface of the platelet, of the active platelet. We get degranulation of the vesicles, which contain a number of substances to potentiate the platelet plug, as well as the clotting cascade later on. We get release of thromboxane A2, which can go ahead and recruit neighboring platelets and activate them as well. Once we have a couple or more activated platelets, we can begin aggregation. So as I mentioned, GP2B3A receptors are abundantly available on the surface of an active platelet. These GP2B3A receptors can bind to fibrinogen or von Willebrand factor thereby binding to a neighboring platelet's GP2B3A receptor and aggregating these two platelets together. So we have GP2B3A receptors binding to fibrinogen and then binding to a neighboring platelet's GP2B3A receptor causing those platelets to come together in aggregation. So they're coming closely together to form a plug. This can also occur with GP2B3A receptor on one platelet binding to von Willebrand factor then to GP2B3A receptor on a neighboring platelet, active platelet, causing them to aggregate together 
This is a soft spongy plug. It is not a solid plug. However, it is working to reduce the amount of blood loss from that area. Here is what it looks like in pictorial form. So we have over here in step one, we have GP1A receptor, which is available on a resting platelet recall, is binding directly to collagen at the injury site. We also have GP1B receptors, which are available on a resting platelet that are going to bind to von Willebrand factor. And then that von Willebrand factor is going to bind to the collagen at the injury site. When that occurs, we get expression through a conformational change of the GP2B3A receptors on the surface of the platelet. So these GP2B3A receptors are now available to promote the process of aggregation. Platelet activation occurs when we adhere to the injury site. So adhesion will lead to activation. As we adhere to the injury, whether it be through 1A or 1B or both, we get conformational change of that platelet. So instead of being this smooth, round-ish platelet, we then get these very active, extended-armed platelets, as you'll see here. That conformational change also causes the release of thromboxane A2 and degranulation of the vesicles, including ADP within that vesicle, which is very important for further activation of neighboring platelets. So whether it be thromboxane A2, as seen here in this arrow, or ADP, those substances are released from this adhered to activated platelet that then can go and activate neighboring platelets that are floating by in the injury area. That leads to further adherence of these platelets to the injury as well as they are ready now to aggregate together. They release further, they further release more thromboxane A2 and more degranulation causing an active recruitment of neighboring platelets within the area. Platelet aggregation is when we get that conformational change, we express our GP2B3A receptors, which are the most abundant receptors available on the active platelet. And then between those GP2B3A receptors, we can either aggregate using fibrinogen, as depicted on the left, or von Willebrand factor, as depicted by the arrow on the right. Either way, we're bringing those platelets together, and you'll notice that they're close together, they're bound tightly, so that they form a platelet plug. And the more platelets that you have recruited to that area, they become more active platelets, and we're aggregating more and more platelets to form a rapid plugging of the area. This is what it can look like in a cellular model. We have GP1A, we have GP1B. These both bind to collagen, whether it be through von Willebrand factor with 1B or just directly to collagen with 1A. We get a conformational change. That conformational change will release thromboxane A2 as well as release ADP into the system, into the blood. And we get a conformational change that's allowing for the expression of GP2B3A receptors as noted on both of these cells. Thromboxane A2 is promoting the activation of this neighboring platelet. If a thromboxane A2 did not activate it, that's okay because we had ADP coming over here and binding to those P2Y1, P2Y1-2 receptors, which are commonly referred to as ADP receptors on that neighboring platelet. That can cause activation, and that activation, whether it be through thromboxane A2 or ADP, can express the GP2B3A receptors on this platelet. So both of these platelets are active, they have that expression of the GP2B3A receptors, in which case they're able to aggregate. In this example, they're aggregating with fibrinogen. So we have fibrinogen bound to this ADP, this GP2B3A receptor on the platelet, as well as fibrinogen binding to this GP2B3A receptor on the second platelet that is bringing those platelets together and binding them tightly together. If fibrinogen was not there, no fail, we also have von Willebrand factor that can aggregate those platelets as well. Here we have adhesion that promotes activation, as I mentioned. 
We have activation of neighboring platelets through thromboxane A2. We have release of ADP, which can further activate neighboring platelets as bound through those ADP receptors. And activation of that platelet that is neighboring will release more thromboxane A2, more ADP, and have a conformational change expressing the GP2B3 receptors on that platelet. Once they're both active, they're able to aggregate via their GP2B3A receptors. In this case, they're aggregating using fibrinogen. You can also recall that these platelets can aggregate using von Willebrand factor. This concludes part one of the five video series. Please continue on to part two in the videos and bring your questions to class, any concerns that you might have for discussion. Thank you.